I'm just a little bit anxious. Hey everybody, how are you? Welcome to part three of our series, Anxious for Nothing. Uh, if you're new at an Eastside campus today, my name is Gene, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, would you help me out with something? Let's give a great big welcome to all our Eastside family joining us out in Redlands, Park Rapids, Bellflower, Anaheim, La Habra, online today. We love you guys. And uh, before we jump into our subject today, I wanna give you a sneak peek at just what's coming up. People have been asking me, Gene, are we doing an At The Movies series this year? And if you're new, uh, this is our biggest, most anticipated series we do every year where we unpack biblical truth through Hollywood blockbusters. And I'm thrilled to announce we are kicking off At The Movies five weeks from today. So I'm telling you now, so you can start inviting, thinking about who you're gonna bring, because it's, it's really a high impact series. You can only view these at an Eastside campus. They're not available online. We don't stream these, okay? So you gotta be here. In two weeks, uh, just before that, we're gonna do a three-part series that's so important on the power of our words. We're calling it sticks and stones. Words have the power uh, to build up or tear down. Words have the power to bring life or death in a friendship, in a relationship, in a marriage, in the heart of a child. So it's very important. Next weekend, we're not only gonna wrap up Anxious for Nothing, but uh, it's Super Bowl weekend. We always have some other fun stuff planned for that. Plus, uh, after praying and consulting with heaven and the Bible, I'll be making my annual prediction of the winner of Super Bowl 54 next weekend. Some of you did not know I have that gift, but I'll be exercising it, okay. But today, we're gonna talk about anxiety. And I wanna begin with these two numbers because these two numbers tell a story. The latest statistics say that 40 million adults, and the number is growing, admit to struggling with anxiety in the US. Anxiety disorders are the most common disorders in our country. Now get this, according to the World Health Organization, over the past three decades, just in the last 30 years, anxiety disorders have jumped by more than 1,200%. My grandparents lived through World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. And yet we have 1,200% more anxiety than they did. Does that make any sense? Now, as I've said repeatedly throughout this series, some anxiety is physiological, some is emotional, some is circumstantial. Some levels of anxiety are so severe they require medication or counseling. And if you need meds, please get the help you need. Take your meds prescribed by professionals. Don't think you can stop taking them because you don't think you need them anymore. Lean on the pros, okay? But in addition to the physiological, emotional, and circumstantial causes of anxiety, anxiety always, always, always has a spiritual component to it, and that's what I'm trying to deal with in this series. And we're working our way through some words written by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter four. We're right in the midst of these words. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Some translations say, anxious for nothing. Here's the context. Let me remind you, Paul is not writing from Club Med. He's writing from a prison cell in Rome. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome because it was the New York City of the day. It was like the center of the universe. He believed if he could reach the influencers in Rome with the good news about Jesus, he could reach the world faster. This is why we've started five campuses. We dream about starting seven more by 2025 to reach people faster. So his dream was to go to Rome, and now he's in Rome, which is great, but what's not so great He's in prison, he's chained to a guard, a Roman guard, 24 hours a day. So he writes from his Roman prison cell with these words from Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse four. This is from the GAT version of the Bible. Blame God. I'll say it again, just blame God. Let your anxiousness be evident to all. The Lord is nowhere to be found. Stress out about everything, big stuff, little stuff, things you can't control, things you wish you could, things that might come true, and things that could never possibly happen. In every situation, see it as an opportunity to gripe to other people about how bad you've got it, how everyone else is cruising through life. Allow your envy and self-preoccupation to blow the problem out of proportion. Above all, never talk to God about it. He doesn't give a rip. 
And if you continue this path, the anxiety that transcends all human understanding will give you ulcers, heart disease, headaches, joint pain, and lousy relationships. So rejoice and be glad. Like I said, this is from the G-A-T version, which is the Gene Apple translation. <laughs> which is actually the way I've thought too many times in my life. How about you? God, you let me down. God, I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. Because of the hell that I'm going through right now, God, I'm quitting my small group. I'm done going back to church. I'm done with it all. I'm done with you, God. Anybody relate to the Gene Apple translation? But Paul has a totally different perspective than that, than we typically do, right? Here's what he really says, Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is what? Near. He's near. Do not be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which is what we're all looking for, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, last week, we focused on this one single verse, Philippians 4, 6, on how God wants us to get ultra-specific with him in our prayers concerning what we're anxious about, you know, to lift up our prayers, petitions, and requests. But today, I want to focus on one single word in this one single verse, and here's the word. Did you notice we skipped this word last week? Here's my sermon in a sentence today. Anxiety goes down as Thanksgiving goes up. Our goal in this series is to move from anxiety to peace, from anxiety to peace. Calm, C-A-L-M. In week one, the title of my message was Celebrate Who God Is. He's good. He's in control. Position yourself between his goodness and control. He's near. In week two, the title of my message was Ask God for Help. He wants us to cast our anxiety on him. He wants us to get ultra specific in our prayers. Not for his benefit. He already knows, but for ours. But today, the title of my message is List. List what you're thankful for. Now, next weekend, we'll wrap up with the M, which stands for, you'll just have to be here to find out what it stands for, okay? Because all four of these go together. So let me say our sermon in a sentence again. Anxiety goes down as Thanksgiving goes up. Many of you don't believe that. But I believe the quickest way to get rid of anxiety is to double down on Thanksgiving in your life because gratitude and anxiety can't coexist. Why? Because you can't live in the world of what if, what if, what if, and live in the world of already at the same time. Anxiety is about a future fear. It's out in the future. It may or may not happen, while gratitude is about a present blessing that is going on right now. And you can't live in both of those worlds at the same time. There's actually been a lot of research done on the power of gratitude. It has so many powerful benefits. In fact, if it came in a pill, we would call it a wonder drug. Gratitude improves your sleep, which means you have less fatigue, less depression, less anxiety. Gratitude improves your physical health. Research shows you can actually reduce inflammation at a cellular level just by being grateful. I love what this Benedictine monk said. He said, happiness does not make you grateful. It is gratefulness that makes you happy. On the other hand, I heard about this guy who became a monk, had to take a vow of silence. He was only allowed to speak two words every year. At the end of the first year, he walks into the friar who says, yes, my son, what would you like to say? And he just had two words, room cold. After another year of silence, he goes back at the end of the year, he goes to the friar, has two words for him. He just says, bed hard. After a third year of silence, he asks, what would you like to say? Two words, food bad. At the end of year four, he came in and just let out these two words, I quit. <laughs> the friar said, well, it doesn't surprise me. All you've done is complain since you got here. 
I want to show you the Greek word for gratitude. Eucharistias. Eucharistias. Now, as you look at that word, does anyone see an English word we might get from it? How about this word? Yeah. Eucharist. Or the Lord's Supper. We take some time every week here to express our gratitude, our thanksgiving to God. You take a little piece of bread to remember the one whose body was broken and died for you. Then you take a cup to remind you of the blood that Jesus poured out as a substitute payment for your sins so that you're free from guilt, free from shame, free from fear of the future. This is a great place to begin your list of gratitude, what Jesus did. Let me show you another important word inside the word gratitude. Charis. This is the Greek word for grace. Our salvation comes to us by grace through faith in Jesus. Grace is at the core of a relationship with Jesus. When God gave you life, it was an act of grace. When he gave you breath, it was an act of grace. From the food you eat to the water you drink, it's grace upon grace upon grace. There is a third word in this word gratitude, and it's kara. This is the word for joy. When God's Holy Spirit lives in us, he fills us with joy that just like erupts and bubbles up from the inside of us. So here's what I've come to realize. Grace is what you receive, joy is what you experience, and gratitude is what you give. We get grace from God the Father, we get joy from the Holy Spirit, and we express gratitude for what was given to us through Jesus Christ, and we celebrate this every week through the Eucharist. Isn't that cool? And as we do this, anxiety goes down as our gratitude and thanksgiving goes up. Let's face it, it's not easy to live with gratitude in this culture, especially with social media. We scroll through our Facebook feed or Instagram feed. We see everybody else's highlight reels, their Whole30 dessert, their yet another stunning vacation in Barbados, their amazing Pinterest-inspired preschool snacks, <laughs> their CrossFit wad, their workout of the day, their kids all dressed in adorable outfits that they handcrafted. They're eating vegetables from their garden that they planted on their farmhouse table that they built yesterday afternoon from some pallets they were throwing away behind Walmart. And all of a sudden, we start believing that we're not good enough, we're not blessed enough, we're not beautiful enough, we're not smart enough, we're not worthy enough. And our anxiety goes up as our thanksgiving and gratitude goes down. I can't remember the name of the theologian who made this statement, but it's not only deep, but it's right on target. As you go through life, make this your goal. Look at the donut and not the hole. Gratitude right there. Now, I want to ask you to do something right now, because if you don't do this, this sermon is going to be useless. I want to ask every person at every campus just to pull out your phone right now, and I want you to make a list. I want to go to a memo on your phone. I want you to make a list and start making a list while I'm talking of just things you're thankful for. Some of you, if you still live in the 17th century, pull out a pen and paper. That's fine. You just go old school. But start making a list of what you're grateful for. Maybe it's the food you eat, where you live, the bed you sleep in. Maybe the names of friends or family members that start coming to mind, children, grandchildren, the answer to a prayer. The person who gave you your first Bible, the, the person or persons who pointed you to Jesus, the person who invited you here, just whatever comes to mind, good things, pepperoni, puppies, Putting your underwear on straight out of the dryer. <sighs> you should be up to four or five items by now, okay? I want you to just keep working on that list because honestly, it's more important that you do that than you listen to what I'm saying right now. Power comes, gratitude comes when you write it down. 
Many of you know of the Duke University legendary basketball coach, Coach K. He's won five national championships, one of the greatest coaches of all time. The last time Duke won the championship was in 2016. And he did an exercise that he credits in large degree for their success. He gave everyone a basketball, coaches and players, and he said, I want you to write on the basketball all the names of all the people who got you here. It could be a friend who supported you, a teammate who passed you the ball, a coach that trained you, a parent who's taken you to hundreds of basketball practices and been at your games. I want you to write down their names and carry that ball throughout the entire tournament with you, on the bus, on the airplane, in the hotel room. Some of them even slept with it to remind them, you're not playing for yourself, you're playing for a wide circle of people around you who helped you get to this place. And that simple exercise in gratitude changed everything. Who has helped you get to this place in life? That's the power of making a list like you're writing down right now, right? It has the power to help you overcome anxiety. Some of you are so focused on what you don't have that you have forgotten what you do have. And listen, whatever you have in Jesus Christ, if you're a follower of his, is greater than anything you don't have. Let me try to illustrate that for you. Let's say one day you're sitting at home. You've never had much. You're one of these people who's always just kind of barely gotten by. But one day, two men in suits come to your door. They ring that video doorbell, and you don't recognize them. But you open the door anyway, and they say, we're attorneys, and we have some bad news and some good news for you. Can we come in? So you sit down at your kitchen table, you invite them in. They say the bad news is that a distant relative of yours has passed away suddenly. Well, you didn't even know them. So like the bad news, it doesn't even shake you up. But the good news is there seems to be an indication that there's a sizable estate and it's complicated and we're just looking to it, but it's all been left to you. Now, here's a check for $10,000. It's all we've been able to find so far. But if you'd like, we'll investigate the size of the estate and come back to you when we find out more. And you say, go ahead, investigate. Nothing else shows up. You're still $10,000 richer than you were before the doorbell rang, right? So you start spending the 10,000 bucks, having a good time with it. You sort of forget about them. Three months later, they come to the door again and they say, this estate, it's larger than we thought. There's a home in Hawaii, there's artwork, there's various bank accounts around. Here's a check for $100,000, and if you'd like, we'll just keep going back and, and digging more. You say, keep digging, go on back. And you're dancing around the house because $100,000 is more money than you've ever had at one time in your life. So you start spending it and having a great time. Three months later, they're back again. This time, the guys are shaking. They say, you're not gonna believe this, but there are real estate holdings all over the world. We're finding investments worth millions. This is a staggering estate. Here's a check for $1 million. Would you like us to keep investigating? Investigate on, you say. And you're ecstatic thinking, how long is this going to last? $10,000, $100,000, a million dollars. The resources just seem to get greater and greater and greater. And I'll just end that illustration by saying, every three months, they just keep coming back and they announce something new every time, something bigger. And you find out you have a greater inheritance than you ever thought possible. Now, as wild as that illustration seems in the economic sense. That very type of thing happens in the spiritual sense to every follower of Jesus Christ. When you first become a follower of Jesus, having seen that you were a sinner and you were going to stand before a holy God someday, and you found out that God sent a Savior and made it available to you in Jesus Christ, you were just so grateful you were not headed to hell anymore. I mean, just that knowledge is exhilarating, right? People would say, what are you so happy about? I'm saved. I'm not going to hell anymore, right? And you lived on that high for a while. Two or three months later, you begin to find out that when you experience salvation, you are also given the gift of God's Holy Spirit. In addition to being saved, you find out about this tremendous ministry of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you and comforts you and leads you and teaches you and empowers you and gifts you. So for two or three months, you run on that high for a while. 
But then you find out, in addition to that, you've become a part of a family, a community, and you've got brothers and sisters, and you get us in a small group where there's a spiritual bond, and there's laughter, and love, and connection, and community, and you start building relationships in the family of God that are deeper and more significant than any relationships you've ever had before. And you run on that high for a while. And over the course of your spiritual discovery, you keep running into new things, discovery after discovery, God's word, answered prayer, promises all throughout scripture until your heart is so full, it just is about ready to explode. And finally, you come to realize that you can say, I may not have the dream house on the beach. I may not drive the luxury SUV. I may not have millions in my investment portfolio, but because of the Eucharist, I have grace from the Father, joy from the Holy Spirit, unlimited gratitude for the hope that I have in Jesus, both in this life and the life to come. I'm never alone. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. There is nothing that will ever be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I am rich. I am rich. I am rich. Gratitude. Today at every campus, I'm gonna give you an incredible opportunity, maybe something you weren't even thinking about when you came in here today. Some of the greatest opportunities in our lives happen when we least expect them. I wanna give you the opportunity to be baptized into Jesus Christ as an expression of your gratitude to him today. But before I do that, I wanna show you something that, that I hope will open your eyes to how much we have to be grateful for. Something that will help you build your gratitude list. Louis Schwartzberg does some incredible time-lapse photography. And I wanna invite you to take a few minutes and let his images grip your heart as you listen to a 90-year-old man talk about the power of gratitude. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. It's given to you. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you do nothing else but to cultivate that response to the great gift that this unique day is, if you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life, and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. We just think of the weather. And even of the weather, we don't think of all the many nuances of weather. We just think of good weather and bad weather. This day, right now, is unique weather maybe a kind that will never exactly in that form come again. The formation of clouds in the sky will never be the same that is right now. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. 
each one has an incredible story behind their face. A story that you could never fully fathom. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. We all go back so far. And in this present moment, on this day, all the people you meet, all that life from generations and from so many places all over the world, flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water and drinkable water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. So these are just a few of an enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day. You know, I've probably watched those images and listened to those words 20 times this week. You think this is just another day in your life. It's not just another day. It's the one day that's given to you. It's a gift. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. So respond as if it was the first day of your life and the very last day of your life, and you will have spent this day very well. And that's what I want to invite you to do today and to receive the Eucharist today. Receive the grace from God the Father who loves you more than you know by, by putting your faith in Jesus today to experience the joy of the Holy Spirit of God and his presence that will be with you now and forevermore. And to give gratitude to Jesus for giving his life for you by following his example and expressing your faith and thankfulness and gratitude in baptism today. I want you to just look at some of the faces of people who've been baptized at Eastside campuses. Think about words that come to your mind as you look at their faces and their expressions. What descriptions would you use? Gratitude, thankfulness, joy, peace, calm. Isn't this what we all want? Isn't this what we're all looking for? And today, in a few moments, this could be your, you. This could be your response. This is not just another day. This is the one day given to you. So respond to it as if it was the last day of your life and you will have spent it very well. Anxiety goes down as thankfulness goes up. There's no better way to celebrate Eucharist, the gift of God's grace received through faith in his son than by responding with baptism Baptism was so personally important to Jesus. The very first thing that he did when he began his public ministry was to be baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, in the Jordan River. And then in his final instruction to his followers, he told them to go and make disciples or followers of Jesus. And the first thing that they were to do was to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Baptism was to be the first of many steps in their spiritual journey. And all throughout the Bible, when people received Jesus, they just immediately and spontaneously responded to his love in baptism, not begrudgingly, but with gratitude and joy and thanksgiving. They didn't say, I'll be baptized someday when it's convenient. I'll be baptized when the weather's a little better. I'll be baptized when I feel really moved. Or after I take a baptism class, then I'll be baptized. No, they did it the same day, just as a way of saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving my soul. So let me ask you, what's to stop you today from receiving Jesus Christ and responding with gratitude and being baptized today? Here's what we're gonna do. In a few moments, all of our campuses, I'm just gonna count to three. And anybody who would like to make this decision today to be baptized, I'm gonna ask you to rise up on the count of three and to stand in honor of the one who rose from the grave for you. I'm gonna ask our campus pastors and hosts to come to the front of the room right now to get ready for this moment at each site. We're set up for baptisms at every campus. The water is heated, it's over 90 degrees, it's chlorinated, it's ready. We have everything that you need. And you say, but I couldn't do it today, Gene. And I just wanna say, why couldn't you? You say, well, I, I came as a guest with some friends and I don't wanna inconvenience them. Listen, they'll celebrate with you, I guarantee it. You say, well, it took so long to get ready today and I am looking good and I don't wanna get my hair messed up. That's just pride. You say, well, what will people think if I do that? They might think I've made some mistakes and have some sins in my life. Guess what? Look around you. We all have. Don't let these pretty faces fool you. You say, but I wasn't planning on this today. You may not have had it written on your calendar. God had it circled on his. You may have not come prepared. We have everything that you need. Towels, clothes, undergarments, changing areas. You say, well, I'm just visiting. I don't know that I want to become a, a member of this church. That's fine. We're not sure we want you to become a member of this church. <laughs> so we're on the same page. I'm not inviting you to be baptized into a church today. I'm inviting you to be baptized into Jesus Christ today. <laughs> Some of you are like, but I'm terrified of water. Talk about anxiety. What an incredible opportunity to courageously demonstrate that your commitment to Jesus is stronger than your anxiety of water. And beside that, when we baptize somebody, we always resurrect them, okay? You say, but I've been a follower of Jesus for years. I, I don't need to be baptized now. Well, you do if you've never done it as a believer, as your own personal decision. Now, what we've tried to do is try to take away every excuse that's flowing through your mind right now so that you can just simply respond to Jesus with gratitude. But as convenient as we've tried to make this for you today, it still requires you to courageously take a step. I've heard it put this way. There were a thousand steps between you and God. Jesus took 999 of them for you, but the last step is up to you. So who today, out of gratitude, will take that step and say yes to Jesus Yes to baptism. We're baptizing today anyone junior high age or above. This is your opportunity. Some of you know that God is calling you. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna count to three and I just want you to stand and our campus pastors will explain everything from there. If you came planning to be baptized today, you stand, no excuses, no waiting, no apologies. Maybe whole families do this together, students, men, women, couples, friends. When I say three, you stand in honor of the one who is crucified naked on a cross for you and rose up from the grave for you. You stand, get ready to see their, this church lose their mind with love more than you've ever felt in your life. Right, church? Because we're gonna support people who make this decision today. You stand, all of heaven will break out in a party today. May many stand right now. Let's do it now. One, today is a gift. Two, respond as if this was the last day of your life. Three, with gratitude and thanksgiving, who will stand right now? Good for you, put her there, high five. That's good, God bless you guys. Who else wants to join them? Way to go, way to go. Way to go back there. What a move of God we're seeing right before our eyes right here. Way to go, you guys.
Just stay on your feet if you would. Just stay on your feet. And uh, we're going to pray for you right now. And then after we pray, we're going to dismiss you. And if you have family or friends with you, they'll go with you. And you can either just go through that door right there or that door. One of those two doors. There's a team waiting for you there. They'll just go down the hall, get you all fixed up at our changing rooms, and we'll have your baptisms out on the plaza just about 10 minutes from now. And anybody can come out and celebrate who would like to celebrate. Let's pray for these courageous people right now. God, thank you for moving in this place today. Thank you for people overwhelmed with gratitude by your grace and your goodness through Jesus Christ. Thank you that they are putting or have put their faith in you and have trusted the payment that Jesus has made on the cross for them. And today they obey him with obedience in baptism. And God, we look forward to celebrating with them in a few moments out on the plaza. We thank you for those who've built into their lives, people who've prayed for this day, maybe even had conversations, people who've stayed up late, who've invited, and here is a day of great fruit in their life. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.